hey, you can increase the pricing, but you can only increase the prices so much until it hits the ceiling of the willingness to pay. So what you have to do is you have to understand the willingness to pay. You can analyze it. You can Google it. There are so many examples out there. You only have to look out for that you have, that you ask your customers who are really your customer base and you ask them in the context of the real product. Yeah, it's, it's not a fantasy question here, right? You need to show the product and you really have to ask the tough questions. And if you have done this and you have the willingness to pay for your product, the pricing needs to be slightly lower or you have to increase the value on top of the willingness to pay. That means you can increase the prices, but you can never go up higher than the willingness to pay. Then you have churn or people don't convert from the freemium model. Hello and welcome to the Product People Podcast. Here we learn from the most amazing people in the product space for 30 minutes at a time. At Product People, our mission is to help companies discover and deliver great products faster. We do that by doing hands-on product management work at companies of all sizes and also by sharing knowledge generously with our community of more than 20,000 product enthusiasts. My name is Romuita and today we have Alex Balk with us. Alex comes from a technical background, having held positions of CTO, founder, product manager in different industries and types of company, and he is now the director of product at Product People. We talked a lot about value creation as the core function of product and about ways that a company can turn that created value into captured value. I hope you enjoy the conversation. You're now a fractional director of product at Product People. But it would be interesting to start a bit with your background. What was your path before joining Product People? Before Product People, I had several roles within the Berlin startup scene as a producer, which is basically product owner, product manager in one role. I was technical product manager in health tech, regular individual, individual contributor at various startups, but also head of product at a social network. Cool. Due to the nature of our work now at Product People, but also with your previous experience with several different companies, it's like more common for us to change companies and change industries than for a regular PM, let's say. What has been your personal experience with it? What are some of the pros and cons of this situation of changing companies mm -hmm. and changing industries? Yeah. It's absolutely fair to change companies like every two or three years in, in our industry, right? Especially because with, also within companies, strategies change so quickly, companies pivot, right? So therefore the company changes. So if you change the company, it's, it's basically the same thing. And at some point, you really much learned a lot of things at these companies, at these organizations, and there is just so much you can learn within these organizations. So jumping, going to another organization and, and basically try out your learnings in a different environment to basically also validate it, right? Because some aspects you learn may only be applicable for one organization. So therefore, it makes absolutely sense. There are industries we are changing so often is, is, yeah, it's not applicable, right? In more traditional jobs, but in our tech, in our tech world, absolutely. So you've seen many different companies working and you've been in the product manager role at different levels of seniority in different companies. And it also in my experience, the product manager role is never the same into different companies. But in general terms, how do you define the role of product within the organization? Oh, absolutely. And yeah, you're right. Different organizations see that title of product manager quite different, right? Some just see it as a delivery manager, even confuse it with product ownership, right? Even from the, from the HR um, manifesto. Product management, broadly speaking, is looking out for the opportunities, yeah? looking out what concerns the users, connecting user concerns, user problems with expected and desired business outcomes. Yeah? working with engineering, working with design, marketing, and other disciplines within the organization on the best solutions, and then bring them to the market. Maintain them and then help together with, with business development to monetize it. 
Cool. You mentioned an interesting part right at the end, the monetization bit. And also in a recent talk you gave, you talked about value creation and value capturing. How do you define the value equation? So the value equation basically has three, three parts. So first, it always starts with the value creation itself. So you need to give something to users. Yeah? Maybe giving time back, resolving pain, like resolving manual work, for example, sparking joy, right? The Netflix model, watching a movie or so. Yeah? And then it goes into the value capturing afterwards. So basically, what are your revenue streams? How much do you charge? Maybe you charge money. Sometimes you charge the basically we as a collection of data, right? These social network models here. Yeah. And afterwards, we have the third component, which is the cost. So, like, how much does it cost for you to build that product? And value creation needs to be greater than value, value cap capturing, and value capturing needs to be bigger than cost. You can basically If you look at the lean canvas, where you have the unique value proposition, which is creating value, you have the revenue streams on the bottom right, and you have the cost structure, which is on the bottom left. And this is a triangle. It starts on top, goes to the right bottom, and then the left bottom. How does that happen? Like, how do you go from value creation to monetization? What are the things that you need to consider? So the first things you always need to consider is What's your customer segment? It, these activities of value creation don't work if you don't know who you are serving. Yeah? So what's your customer segment? Maybe even go further. What's your ideal customer profile? Yeah? Don't serve everyone. Right? Uh, also within that customer segment, try to find your early adopters. They help you to better narrow down the problems we are talking now. For these customer segments, you've identified the three main problems that are really concerning the customer base for a new product or service or an existing one, it doesn't matter. And you have to look into what are the existing alternatives this customer segment is doing. In B2B SaaS, very, very often, Microsoft Excel is the alternative solution. Yeah? And you are competing against that. So before we even think about the solution, how we serve our clients, you need to look like, how are we getting the job done right now? A tool of choice is then for sure also the customer journey map, yeah, where you see before, during, and after the journey what's going, what's going on, right? And where the customer is struggling. Cool. And when you have that identified, when you know how you are going to create something for them, how do you turn that into money in the bank? How do you decide how to charge money and how can you? grow your revenue with it? Yeah, a great question. So from my point of view, the product manager can for sure run certain experiments of identifying the willingness to pay. And that's a joint effort with marketing because of the customer acquisition cost, with sales or business development. What still needs to happen is that the product that has been, or the service that has been developed, or maybe even just designed, It needs to be tested with the customers, first of all, to understand if these are really solving the problem and what is the willingness to pay. The, the, yeah, basically, the price the user wants to pay in the end. Yeah? Without the solution solving really much the problem, it makes no sense to ask for a price right? or ask like, about the willingness to pay. Right? First, it needs to do the job. Having that said, it is important to look into what competition is doing. Yeah, I said like Microsoft Excel is the is an alternative solution, but there might be for B2B SaaS or for other B2C world, there are always competitor products and you better have them. Otherwise, maybe, maybe there is no market if there is no competition. Yeah. So you need to rank the key attributes your customers are interested in, either in terms of their problems or in terms of their solutions It depends on how far you are in your development. And you need to ask your, your customers how, how important these problems or the solutions are. And you compare how good you will fix these problems compared to your competition. It is in your best interest that your organization, your product team is solving the most 
the, the biggest three or the highest three problems better than your competition. If they don't do it, there is no need of monetizing. There is no need of jumping on like, oh, what's the willingness to pay, right? You first need to have the confirmation from your clients. Yeah, I will pay for it because it does the job right. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And before we go a bit on expanding on on pricing, I think it's quite interesting to go there. But before that, can you share some tactics to get the client's willingness to pay? You mentioned that it's important to understand their willingness to pay. Do you have some like specific tactics that PMs can use to, to understand the willingness to pay? Yes, absolutely. So because I get the question quite often, like, do we need to have the product or service completely built out on a, on a page with checkout paths and all these kind of things? It's absolutely not necessary. What you can do is you can even with a clickable Figma prototype, give that to a customer and the customer clicks through that, is for sure targeted, right? The customer needs to have that problem, specific problem, and the solution better don't need any explanation because it is very simple and the user knows your product or knows different products and knows what's going on, like terminology is clear, etc. Yeah? And to let the customer like independently go through that and needs to have an aha moment in the end, needs to have like, wow, This is crazy, right? It only took me like two steps. Right? Give you an example, like signing, signing, merging and signing PDFs. Yeah? We, had, we got better. We come a far, a long way, right? But now tools like Small PDF and others, you go in, you don't even need to sign up sometimes, upload your PDF, you merge something, uh, and then and you make an e-signature and it's done. Very simple. But imagine this takes like 15 minutes and you, you are a small business. And you have to do this every day. Imagine like getting getting basically 10 minutes of that time because it's some parts are automo uh, automated and or yeah, but basically cut out because it's unnecessary. That's a huge game changer. And if you get capture that and uh, get these wow, then you're on a good path. And then you can ask like, how much would you charge? Another uh, idea, another another uh, thing you can do is if you have already a product and you monetize it, but you're unsure if, if you get everything out there, yeah? you can simply add a new tier to your basically a list of products you're selling, right? Another premium, right? Or another budget version of that. Yeah? And you don't have to have that implemented. Your website just needs to support it. And if users click on it, you just show them then a, a form saying like, oh, we are working on it. We'd love to get your feedback. There, with that formula, you can also fake a little bit that there is a new product or a new product, let's call it product offering, right? This, this new functionality is just bundled together for a different price. Because sometimes yeah. these pricing models are not really suited to everyone. A right? good example is also Microsoft Office, for example, right? You get everything in this one tier and it's very expensive or you get like, oh, I only want Word or I only want to have like Teams, right? I want Teams and Microsoft Excel as well, right? So like, how do, these, how do these bundles look like? And then you can build up your own bundles and see how that resonates. Yeah, that's a good one. How do you think pricing can influence the perceived value of a product? Like your pricing can give a different idea to the, the person buying it. Is that something oh, absolutely. that... See Absolutely. Look, if customers will all you comp always compare you to competition. If you are priced higher, the perceived value needs to be higher. But on the flip side, that means if your perceived value is higher, you can also price higher. So it it's always comes together. Yeah? So if you don't want to be chased by competition of like they are lowering the prices, right? Because that's how they sneak the clients, right? That's how they get the new clients from, from competition, right? If you don't want to be in that competition, in that spiral of giving discounts, you always need to have an increased perceived value to be able to charge more than competition. And then you are not in the game. You, you keep your pricing. The competition can do the, the, the discount race, right? You don't have to. Absolutely, you don't have to. Yeah? So pricing 
sets you apart. If you are able to price high, you have, and clients buy you, right? Clients stick with you, they don't churn. You have a more superior product. You have a better standing against your competition. Your branding, your brand reputation, right, is higher. Uh, it often reference, right, Apple, right? Why, why can they charge so much for their iPhones, right? It's a similar technology than Samsung or, or Huawei or other uh, smartphone manufacturers, but they're always going like 200, 300 euros more for what, what is technology-wise not better, right? But for sure, it's basically the reputation they're having. Customers know if they buy it, it just works, right? With that, they can play. They can, they can always charge more. And customers will stick with them because of past, because of customer service, because of whole repetition. And, uh, you know, when you have an iPhone, right, it's, it just works, right? It's also part of an ecosystem. That's a different topic, right? You have a MacBook. And if you get these new fancy glasses, which will, may come out next year, right, part of the ecosystem, right, it's, it just makes yeah. sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think what you're referring to is what can be called like pricing power, right? The ability to, for a company to price higher. Absolutely, yes. Everyone yes. wants to have a better or higher pricing power, right? But what are maybe like the two or three areas that a company should focus on in order to increase their pricing power, other than just like having a better product, which is obviously the goal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. If you look into the Lean Canvas and the customer segment, right, choose your customer segment and the market in which this customer segment is operating in very wisely. Yeah? I said already, if there's no competition, it's actually not a good sign. If there's too much competition, it's also not a good sign. Choose your sweet spot. Yeah? And then the customer segment within that, there might be an ideal customer profile. So you nail down and go down and go down and for these customer segments and the ideal customer profile within, you understand the real problems, right? And for them, you build the real product, a product that really solves the, the problem. And there you have pricing power. If you make a superior product, competition is behind, right? You saw what they're not doing great, right? Then you brand it according to, to basically to the needs as well. Yeah? You put in superior customer success if necessary, right? Even if you are, if you are doing self-service onboarding and all this kind of stuff, yeah, you want to make sure that customers feel that you are a, a partner with them. Yeah? Customer success can even be a, a, a point where you can make a difference, right? You have sometimes products that don't work, but as soon as a customer picks up the phone and calls customer service and says, like, I have a problem and they fix it, happy, happy day. Right, and they stick with you, right? You can cheat a lot of things, a shitty product with customer service. Cool. All right. So how, how do you look at feature prioritization, taking into account the goal of increasing the perceived value? Yeah. I think what you have to always look out for is, like, where are you compared to your competition? If you do a SWOT analysis or Porter 5 analysis, if you are already very far ahead from competition, yeah, there is no need to always add more and more features to increase the perceived value if you already have that, basically, if you're already leading, right? It, you have to make sure you have to constantly add more value for your customers. But if you already had, it makes sense maybe to invest more into scalability. Maybe look also into like how internal processes are, right? Are we able to catch up with new clients, right? With like this onboarding. So it does make sense to, to open the doors and say like, oh, this is a massive great product. And then your organization is not ready to get the influx of, of these customers. Yeah. So you have to take all into this into consideration. And what helps is for sure, if you have a strategy, right? If you know like, oh, look, we have a big churn or our customer acquisition costs are just too high. Right, we need to work on or on the value creation. So we need more features to create more value for our customers. But if the strategy is like, oh my God, no, we are basically selling our product like, like fresh bread with butter, right? So like we need to scale here, right? We need to be able to scale our organization, maybe internal tooling, etc. This is how you have to then prioritize. And for this, you need a strategy. Absolutely. It cannot change this on a weekly basis. 
I'm curious how you would approach like a real situation, for example, a company that has a feature that all the competitors have. So it's expected that they have it and they are trying to decide if they go for that one or for something that their competitors don't have, but they have like strong evidence that the clients would give importance to it. How would you think about it? Would you go more to the disruptive thing that's different from the competitors or to the one that you should have because all the competitors have? I think what is important is to look into the, the user journey itself, first of all. Just neglecting certain features a competition has, which you think like is not worth to catch up, if these are crucial aspects of the user journey, maybe you just need to build them, right? And there is no way around it. And the Carnot model can also help you with these features, right? Which you need to just prioritize to build because they are being as expected to be in the product. Yeah. And sometimes some products don't work with these low features that you think like, like why do we have them, right? Imagine like you, small PDF, you had this example, right? Assigning a PDF. I think what is crucial is that you have an upload functionality that also takes images or maybe Word documents, right? If you don't have this basic functionality, you ask the customer to use a different tool that converts your images or Word documents into PDF before uploading, right? That is not a great user experience. Huh? Yeah. And therefore, there's a commodity you have to have that. And then the e-signature and maybe like signatures as fingerprint, et cetera, right? That's at a premium, right? That's in the eye opener. Yeah? Or like what's nowadays also you have like multiple e-signatures. Yeah. And all these kind of things. Yeah. Interesting. Cool. Thank you for sharing that. In in terms of uh, pricing, I mean, obviously you typically want to increase revenue. So if you can increase price, you would increase price because more money would come from that. But is that actually the case all the time or are there some nuances on like situations where you wouldn't want to price as high as possible? Yeah. A uh, good question. I mean, absolutely want to raise prices, right? Maybe even to avoid layoffs, right? Last year, uh, a lot of companies changed from like a growth strategy, even like freemium models, like these 10 minutes delivery services, right? Charge very little. Also like this e-scooter and, and e-bike companies, right? Which charge like just a penny for a minute of, your, of the ride. But then they changed to basically revenue strategies, right? To increase revenue. And for some, it worked for some, it didn't. And now you also see more layoffs, right? They're running out of money. And then, okay, you can increase the pricing, but you can only increase the prices so much until it hits the ceiling of the willingness to pay. So what you have to do is you have to understand the willingness to pay. You can analyze it. You can use Garbo Grange or Van Destendorp analysis or conjoint analysis right there. You can Google it. There are so many examples out there. You only have to look out for that you have that you ask your customers who are really your customer base and you ask them in the context of the real product. Yeah, it's, it's not a fantasy question here, right? You need to show the product and you really have to ask the tough questions of like when it's too expensive, when it's too cheap or when it's quite right. Yeah? And if you have done this and you have the willingness to pay for your product, the pricing needs to be slightly lower or iteratively, you have to increase the value on top of the willingness to pay that means you re higher the bar and you can increase the prices. That all goes together, right? The more value created, the more you can also lift up the pricing, right? But you can never go up higher than the willingness to pay. Then you have churn or people don't convert from the freemium model, right? Or will immediately churn also on your website when they see the first pricing. Yeah. Yeah, that makes total sense. Cool. How much involvement do you think PMs, like individual contributor PMs, should have with financial matters? Like maybe also what are some financial metrics, if any, they, that they should be looking at? Yeah, it depends really much on the size of the organizations, right? In the, like these 20 people startups, right? I mean, they're absolutely involved, but you also have like everyone in C-level involved in, in the pricing strategy. The bigger the organizations get, Product is, in this case, just one 
an individual contributor to that discussion, right? They are responsible for lifting the bar of value created so that business development can set the price, right? You are not helping as a product manager business development if you don't create new value, right? If they hit the ceiling, if they cannot go higher and say like, oh, here we cannot price higher, we are basically not hitting our revenue targets. And at some point, also engineering from the bottom, engineering and everyone involved in building it will say like, hey, costs are increasing and cost is catching up to pricing, right? And then pricing wants to go higher, cannot go higher because you didn't do the job of increasing the value. So product management ultimately needs to work on value creation. Value capturing is business development. Yeah? So it's, they have to have a con continuous discussion about it yeah? and, a, and a strategic discussion as well. Oftentimes when you see like, oh, let's build that feature for that one customer. Yeah, you increase the value for that one customer. But you need to have the discussion of like, what we see all the other 10 customers we're having. How are we making sure that we increase the value for all our customers and all our future customers as well? Yeah, And that's a discussion you need to have. And that's always the, the tandem. That's always the conversation that happen continuously. And that's how you are able to increase prices. Cool. So the bigger the organization, your focus goes more to just like making sure that you're creating value and not necessarily being involved in the nitty gritty of the pricing. Exactly. Also because you need to, you need to let them experiment, right? The pricing page is usually not the place where their product management is involved. They advise of like, we have these pieces of product or service, you can bundle them together. It's possible, right? You are an advisor in this area, but yeah. like they are not going in and say like, oh, let's create now a new, new, new tier, right? A new bundle here and let's price it like this, right? That is, that's business development. Mm -hmm. You also ask about uh, certain metrics, right? Customer acquisition costs, customer lifetime value. These are important figures product managers need to know because they need to also understand if something is not going well, right? If, if product managers have to decide on prioritization, if they don't know that tides are shifting, higher customer acquisition costs because of new competition, right? Social media platforms raise the prices for cost per click, for example. Like, what can we do here? Yeah? Mm -hmm. So maybe at some point, it's uninevitable to increase prices. Product management have to, needs to have a strategy to support that. But yeah. it requires also knowing these metrics and knowing when they are changing. Yeah. So for product management, when they have their fancy amplitude dashboards or other kind of dashboards like Looker and Co, when they look into like uh, user metrics, like daily active users, like task done metrics, etc., that's all good. But they better have also a view on like, what was the customer acquisition cost of the last cohort? How does the customer lifetime value change over the last months? Yeah, And right. if, there's, if there are significant changes, you need to have a discussion then. It makes mm -hmm. also discussions about like the next quarter, right? Easier. You have a better understanding, a bigger, better emphasis even towards business development, why they're asking for raising the prices because you see it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's super solid advice. Cool. And what would be your recommendation? So not necessarily focused on financial stuff. What would be your recommendation for a product manager? to level up and to grow into a product management leader? Yeah. I mean, there are two aspects. I could, I could talk about also about line management here, right? But that's a different topic. If, if people want to go into that, if you just talk about product leadership on as an individual contributor, for example, as a principal, yeah, or a group and product manager, I think what is important is you have to even look more above your horizon. You cannot sit on your desk just for solely focusing on your one product, right? You need to look into the product you are developing. How does it influence other aspects of the organization, right? The organization of the user you are working with, right? The user is the user, but who's the decision maker, right? You need to look broader who you are influencing with your product and look into like what you change something, what influences will it have? This allows you to think more strategically about what comes next. You are not thinking only on the feature level, you are thinking on the initiative level. 
your focus shifts from the micro into the macro. Right? And if you are able to observe all this information, all that context has come to that, because you are in meetings where you are like, what is this? Right? Like, why I am now here with, with sales? Why I am now here with, with all these marketing people? And they're talking all about the campaigns. But this is the world in where product leaders are. If economics are changing, economics at clients, that will have an influence on the buying power of your customers. And that makes significant changes on, your, on the usage. If they have less money in, like your clients have less money in the bank, and they go through all the portfolio of product and service they are using, and your product is not creating that value, or you're not like that basically perceived value, right? He did a, not a great job. And as a product leader, you need to see that coming. As an individual contributor, product manager, you hear about the problems, you work on it. As a product leader, you need to see the train coming. And you only do this because you are zoomed out more, more on the macro. Cool. All right, Alex, thank you so much for joining the conversation today. It was great thank having you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to this Product People podcast episode. Make sure to follow our show on your favorite podcast app so that you don't miss the upcoming conversations with inspiring product leaders. We'd be really happy if you can rate our show on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, or if you share it with someone who might find it interesting. To find out more about us and access our community, check our website, getproductpeople.com, or head over to our YouTube, LinkedIn, or Meetup pages. You can find all the links in the episode description. See you next time.